This next person is a powerhouse. I heard him speak last year and years, uh, years before. Lawrence Larry Ham. What can I say? <laughs> you never get tired of hearing this individual. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to black history and also in terms of being a political activist. He's inspiring. He's motivating. Um, he's a master. And um, I was going to read all of this stuff to you, but you know what? Um, you don't need it. You're right. <laughs> I'm just going to bring him on up. Come on up. Larry Ham. Power to the people. Say it loud. We're going to change it up. It's Black History Month, so we say it loud. I'm. Say it loud. Say it again. Brothers and sisters, I'm very glad to be here this evening. Before I say anything else, I would ask that on this the last day of Black History Month, we pay a special tribute to three of our great heroes who have gone before. Last Friday night was the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X, El Haj Malik, El Shabazz. Many of us call ourselves black today because of Brother Malcolm X. In January, we lost one of our own homegrown, stomped down revolutionaries, Brother Amiri Baraka. And several weeks before that, we lost an international hero, the leader of the anti-apartheid movement who brought down the anti-apartheid government of South Africa. And after serving 27 years in jail, walked out of jail, and literally into the presidency of that country, and that was Nelson Mandela. So I ask if you would join me and let us stand and have a moment of silence for Malcolm X, for Amiri Baraka, and for Nelson Mandela. And if you are so inclined, I'm going to raise my fist in memory and in a salute to those freedom fighters. Long live Malcolm X. Long live Amiri Baraka. Long live Nelson Mandela. Power to the people. I have to say, honestly, that I stand before you in a state that few people would believe if you told them Larry Ham was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> but after hearing the testimony, were y'all listening? Yes. After hearing the testimony, of Karen Brown, Judge Karen Brown. What a testimony. When we, when we talk about the triumph of the human spirit 
and the ability to overcome adversity. I've heard many stories, but few could compare to Judge Brown's testimony. And as I was listening to Judge Brown, it was the words of Frederick Douglass that came to mind. Frederick Douglass once said, it is not the heights that a man attains that is important. It is the depths from which he comes. Karen Brown, if she had a normal life <laughs> and became a judge, that would be a great accomplishment. But to rise up out of the muck and the mire and overcome obstacles that would have destroyed many of us is a testimony to the strength of her character and the fortitude of her spirit. And in Judge Brown, we see a microcosm of the African American people. In Judge Brown, we see the essence of the African American people. We are a great people. We are a great people. And I tell you tonight, despite all that is negative that we may see in Newark and in Camden and in Patterson and Passaic and Detroit and Chicago, Los Angeles and Atlanta, all of us lament the rates of homicide that exist in the black community the ravages of drugs in our community, the number of our people that are in the jails throughout this nation, despite all of that, I am proud to be a black man in America. I am proud to be a descendant of people who were enslaved in this country. And nothing that they can say nothing that they can repeat over the television and over the radio a thousand and one times. I don't care how many negative stories they have. I am proud to be a descendant of those who overcame enslavement of 500 years, who overcame re-enslavement called Jim Crow segregation. And as we overcame our enslavement, and as we overcame Jim Crow, we will overcome the adverse conditions that affect our people today. I am confident of that. I am confident of that. What we have experienced in this country would have destroyed many other people. Few people could have gone through what we went through, brothers and sisters. And I know tonight is a celebration, but I feel during Black History Month, we have to say something about how we got here today. <laughs> if there's no other time of year for us to recount what happened to our people, we should definitely recount what happened to our people during this time. A word about Black History Month, and I know everybody in here, because I know I'm speaking to all the soldiers, 
Those of you who came out on one of the coldest days of the year, <laughs> you're the soldiers of the movement. And I realize that you're the veterans. And I want to thank you for all your efforts this past year since I was last in this room with you. I know you have been fighting and fighting hard for Judge Brown and for other causes. But why do we celebrate Black History Month in February? How many people know the name Carter G. Woodson? Carter G. Woodson, if you haven't read his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, I ask that you all do. In fact, y'all need to go down to the next Board of Education meeting and ask them to put that on the reading list for social studies courses, the miseducation of the Negro. <laughs> Carter G. Woodson was the second African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University. And imagine this, he received his PhD from Harvard in 1912. Now why is 1912 significant? because it was during the late 19th century and the early 20th century that we saw the height of lynching in America. That was the height of the period of lynching. Now lynching never stopped. It continues to this day. But the literal lynching of black men, hanging them from trees, castrating them, and so forth, and tearing their bodies apart and burning them. That was at its height. And Carter Woodson was at Harvard. It's hard for a black student at Harvard University today. What must it have been like for Carter Woodson at the turn of the century at Harvard University? And I know that many of you would like your children to go to Harvard University or maybe go to Princeton University like I did, or maybe go to Yale University. But there's one thing, brothers and sisters, that we must remember about these fine institutions of higher learning, that they were built with slave labor. And this must never be forgotten. They were built with slave labor. There's a new book out called Ebony and Ivy. And you all should get that book and read that book. And I'm not saying that to discourage young people from going to these, I went to those universities too, but you need to know where you're going. And you need to know the history of these places. And these places, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Brown, and others, were built with the wealth garnered directly from the slave trade and then secondarily from the industries that use slave labor. So Carter Woodson was at Harvard University in 1912, got his PhD. He was the second, the first was W.E.B. Du Bois. Dr. Du Bois' birthday was last Sunday, February 23rd. There are a lot of important dates. I mean, there's something every day of Black History Month. February 1st, 1960. The birthday of Langston Hughes. February 1st, 1964, students from North Carolina A&T sitting at a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and start the sit-in movement. February 11th, Nelson and Mandela is released from prison after 27 years. February 12th, 1909, the NAACP is founded. February 21st, the assassination of Malcolm X, and I can go on and on and on. Carter Woodson came back home. He could have just stayed in the Ivy Tower, but he wanted to share with his community what he learned about black history. Because remember what they were saying at that time, brothers and sisters, that we were people that didn't have a history. This is why we have Black History Month, because of the mythology that we were people that, in fact, the truth of the matter is that they not only thought that we were not a people that had a history, they didn't think we were human beings, period. You know, from the beginning, they knew that the slave trade was wrong. 
Bartholomew de las Casas was in debates in Europe. Initially, de las Casas argued that they shouldn't enslave the indigenous people. You know, that's who they first enslaved. You know when the beginning of slavery was? When Christopher Columbus lands in the Caribbean. That's the beginning of slavery. First slaves taken in the Western Hemisphere by Columbus. The Ararat, the Carib, the Taino, the Boricua, these were some of the indigenous peoples and these were some of the people he enslaved on the first voyage. The first one, not the fifth one, the first one. They took slaves and our children. This is the irony of it. Black and brown children probably sit in Martin Luther King's school on, in October. They cut out little Nina's little Pintas and little Santa Maria's. The teacher leads them in singing, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1492, for many weeks he was at sea, sailing ships at number three. Those ships were slave ships. They took slaves, and the descendants of slaves celebrate the birth, the, the, the advent, the arrival of the man that begins the slave trade. It should not be a holiday. It should be a morning for Native American people and African people. It should be a day of mourning. For 250 years, they enslaved the indigenous, but the indigenous could get away, so they turned to the African. Bartholomew de las Casas, he argued, he said, we should not enslave the indigenous people because they have souls. But what did Las Casas say? He said, we can enslave the African because they have no souls. This was the beginning, from the beginning. And Columbus, where did he learn the art of navigation? He learns it in the slave trade with the Portuguese up and down what they call the Guinea coast, the west coast of Africa. That's where he learns the art of navigation. Slavery of Africans was already in effect before he got to the Western Hemisphere. There were at least 60,000 Africans enslaved on plantations along the Mediterranean. They were gonna put into effect in the Western Hemisphere a system that they had already developed in Europe and in the Mediterranean. And then Columbus and his family and his sons, they're given land in Cuba. You should read Eric Williams' book, From Columbus to Castro. And read Dr. Eric Williams' book, From Capitalism to Slavery, to get the real deal on Columbus. This Columbus that is celebrated. Columbus told the indigenous people that they must bring to him a thimble full of gold every day. Because you literally could go to the river and pan gold and bring gold. And he said, those who do not bring me my thimble full of gold every day, I will cut off your fingers and your hands. And that's what they did. And whole populations of indigenous people were wiped out in the Caribbean. I mean, where we stand today, imagine that. Indigenous people used to live. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that this is the Native American's land. <laughs> this is still their land. And this country, I mean, we talk about the violence, right? How come there's so much violence in America? Well, as Rap Brown said, violence is as American as apple pie. <laughs> this country was founded on violence stands knee deep in rivers of blood. The extermination of the indigenous people, the enslavement of the African. Do you know what Dr. Du Bois's doctoral dissertation was? His doctoral dissertation topic was the suppression of the West African slave trade. And that became a book that he wrote. Du Bois says in the suppression of the West African slave trade that they took a hundred million Africans out of Africa. But only about 10 million made it. Most died in the Middle Passage. Eric Williams says in Capitalism and Slavery that the slave on the slave ship 
had less space than a dead man in a coffin. They had a science to it. They call it loose pack and tight pack. Loose pack was they'd leave him a little room to move around. The problem was that the, the, the object of the slave trade was to make money. Profit was the driving motive. So if we leave them enough space to move around, that means that we're not going to have enough people to make enough money when we get to the other side. So they had tight pack. And you see the vivisection of that ship, right? In some of the books where you see the slaves, I mean, you, I guess a lot of people, well, well, why does it look like that? That, that? It's a picture of them laying in the bowels of the ship. Three months the voyage, they lay in their own vomit and their own excrement. Many went mad from the condition. Women threw their children overboard rather than let them be born into slavery and threw themselves overboard. There are scientists who speculate that there was an increase in the shark populations along the eastern shores of the United States because of the number of dead slaves that went into the Atlantic. They even got right scientific about it. You know, like the British abolished the trade before the United States. And just as the Civil War, and this is a, a lecture for another time, just as the Civil War was about slavery, the war for independence was very much about slavery too. The British abolished the slave trade first. So the British used to seize the slave ships of the Americans. So they would build ships, right, that had trap doors. So if they were stopped by a British naval vessel, they would open the trap doors and literally let the Africans that they had in jail fall into the sea. And you know what happened when we got here. We were branded like animals. Our families were torn apart. Our language and our culture was outlawed. We were given names that were not our own. My wife went to a family reunion about 10 years ago. And she got the historical documents of her family all the way back to slavery. And the county records would have a column, and the column would have names. And the names didn't have no last name, just the first name. Those were the slave names. Some of them didn't even have names. They had man, boy, girl. But some had first names. They had no last name. Why? Because the last name was the slave master's name. Our families torn apart, our language outlawed our names taken away. Nobody can imagine the horrors of slavery, the instruments and the implements. Whole towns in England grew up on the manufacture of things that were used in the slave trade, like the manufacture of chains, the manufacture of the iron belts that went around the kegs of rum that slaves were traded for. Whole cities grew up around this. Birmingham, England. Whole businesses grew up around this. Lloyd's of London. How many of you heard of Lloyd's of London? It's an insurance company. It started, not secondarily, it started as a company to ensure slave ships. And slavery was big business, brothers and sisters. In 1860, the greatest form of capital in America, greater than banking capital and industrial capital combined, was the wealth invested in slaves and the slave trade. So people say America is a great country. It's the richest and most powerful country in the world today. It's rich and powerful because it stole the labor of our great grandparents, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our ancestors. It stole their labor. And if anybody should get reparations, 
the descendants of African people in this country deserve and would be justly compensated with reparations. People say, we walk around here now, and especially the educated black people, that's what gets me the most. The educated the black people that got the most, got two and three degrees, got, took black history courses. I don't understand that you took black history. You know what, right? the white man don't owe me nothing. He owes you everything. He owes you everything. The white man don't owe me nothing. Let me tell you something. For 500 years, people prayed for an end to slavery. They agitated for an end to slavery. They wrote for an end to slavery. They held conventions for an end to slavery. But ultimately, brothers and sisters, it took a war, a civil war, the biggest war this country has ever fought. More Americans, nearly a million, died in the Civil War more than World Wars I, II, Korea, and Vietnam, and Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. 750,000 soldiers alone. This is what it took to break the backbone of the slave system in this country. I was speaking at a program the other night. My sister introduced me. While she was introducing me, she was giving a little black history lesson, and she did pretty good, except she said, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation and it freed the slaves. <laughs> now that's the popular mythology. The fact of the matter is the Emancipation Proclamation was a military recruitment document. The North was not winning the war because the North was divided against itself. There was as much racism in the North as there was in the South. In fact, y'all always talking about the South. There was as much slavery in the North as there was in the South. And don't go looking for Alabama and Georgia. Look right here in New Jersey. There was slavery right here in New Jersey. There were 12,500 registered slaves in New Jersey at the time of 1860, the beginning of the Civil War. You know what the most active slave port was? It wasn't Charleston, South Carolina, it was New York City. Wall Street, Wall Street is where the auction block was. That's why it's the financial center because that's the origin of the finances. That's where the auction block was, on Wall Street. The most active slave port. The most active slave port on the East Coast was New York City. What was the most active slave port after that? Perth Amboy, New Jersey. What was the most active slave port after that? Camden, New Jersey. Why was that? Lincoln didn't win New Jersey in 1860, he didn't win it in 1864. And when Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, the state legislature of New Jersey nullifies Lincoln's power to emancipate slaves in this state. When the Civil War was over and they passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which abolished chattel slavery, which made us citizens, and which gave black men, not black women, black men the right to vote. Women did not get the right to vote until the second decade of the 20th century. It took a three-fourths vote of the states to pass these amendments. There were 36 states, so you needed 24 states to ratify each of those amendments. New Jersey was not in the three-fourths majority on the 13th Amendment, on the 14th Amendment, or the 15th Amendment. This state was very much in sympathy with the South because there was what was called a political economic relationship, political economy. Political economy is the science of the relationship, how one hand of politics washes the other hand of economics. The South sent the raw goods from 
uh, their area up to New Jersey, factories in New Jersey and shops in New Jersey, changed these raw goods into products and sent them back down south. So each side was making money. So the north was divided. It was divided against itself. The first supreme command of the Union forces was McClellan. He wouldn't even fight. Lincoln kept sending him telegrams. McClellan wouldn't fight because he was a Southern sympathizer. They didn't want to kill their brothers from Georgia and their brothers from the Carolinas and their brothers from, they didn't want to kill them. So Lincoln fired McClellan. McClellan comes to New Jersey and is elected governor. And McClellan House is in Montclair a national monument. So Lincoln replaces McClellan with Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant hires a fella that is probably the most hated man in the South today, William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman says that I'm going to teach them the meaning of rebellion. When Sherman gets to South Carolina, he confiscates 30,000 acres of the slave master's land. What does it mean, confiscate? That means he took their land. He took it. With a stroke of a pen, he issues general order number 15. It was a military order saying this land was owned by people who were in rebellion against the government of the United States. Therefore, I, Tecumseh Sherman, do hereby confiscate 30,000 acres, and I give it to the freedmen who worked that land for all these years. That's their land. That's what Tecumseh Sherman did. And based on General Order Number 15, Thaddeus Stevens, in Congress, y'all remember Thaddeus Stevens? Yes. See, it's important, brothers and sisters, that we know the role of whites who supported our struggle. There were many whites who opposed it, but there were some that supported it. There were people like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner who were called the Radical Republicans. And in their band was Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And it was the Radical Republicans, Douglass, Harry Tubman, Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens that went to Lincoln and said, look, Lincoln, you're not winning this war. You got to get some people in the fight who have a real interest in winning. And Lincoln says, who might that be? He says, they say, you need to put arms in the hands of the slaves so that they can fight. Lincoln thinks about it. I should give rifles to the people <laughs> that we are holding as slaves. <laughs> Which way they gonna point them guns? <laughs> but driven by necessity, Lincoln gives in. And 220,000 black men and women. See, it's important when you go deep into our history, brothers and sisters, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion. You know how onion is, you cut it and you see all these concentric rings? History is like that. You got to drill down deep. And when you drill down deep, you know what you do? You destroy lies and falsehood and obfuscation and you recover memory. You know what the greatest weapon of oppression is? The greatest weapon of oppression is not the gun. It's not the chain. It's not bullets, it's not whips, it's not bombs. You know what the greatest weapon of oppression is? To erase a people's collective memory. Because when they erase your collective memory, you have no idea what they did to you. And they can sell you anything, tell you anything. Your mind becomes like a blank slate. You know the Latin term tabula rasa, mean blank slate. And they write what they want you to think on that blank, blank slate. That is why it is imperative 
that we teach our children our history, not just in the classroom, but in our living rooms and in our kitchens and in our dining rooms and in our churches and in our lodges and on the street corners and even in the bars, if we have to go into the bars, we got to teach our history because it is our history that gives our per people identity, purpose, and direction. So they arm Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, 1862. Becomes effective on January 1st, 1863. December 31st, 1862, black people go to church and they have watch night service. Now I know they don't talk about this during watch night service today because I know they have watch night service. But the origins of watch night service is when our people in December of 1862 went to watch and pray to see if the Emancipation Proclamation would be put into effect. So 220,000 black men answered the call. 186,000 joined the Union Army. The others joined the other divisions of the armed forces. Harriet Tubman becomes the only woman at that time to receive the official title of general. Did you know that? She was General Harriet Tubman. You know, we only talk about the part where Harriet Tubman goes back, you know, and one by one, three by three, five by five, rescues our people, makes some like 30 trips to the South and rescues our people. But do you know what else Harriet Tubman did? She was a reconnaissance officer for the Union forces. She, she showed the secret places where the Confederacy used to hide and she would lead the Union forces there so that they could destroy them and capture them. She was so successful at this that this little black woman became General Harriet Tubman and we should honor her the way she needs to be honored today. But here's the irony, brothers and sisters. Here's the rub. Even though they were fighting in the same army, the black troops and the white troops couldn't fight together. They, the black troops were in units called the colored troops. And when they died, they couldn't be buried together. Today, there's a little town you need to go to. How many of you have heard of Pennington, New Jersey? Pennington, New Jersey is a little town between Princeton and Trenton. And the people of Pennington have a cemetery there. You know what the cemetery is called? It's called the African Cemetery. And the People's Organization for Progress, we know about the African Cemetery because we've been there many times. The black people of Pennington in the 19th century because the black soldiers could not be buried in the same cemeteries with the white Union soldiers, bought land, and they called that land the African Cemetery. And nobody is buried in there except the black Union soldiers. And on their headstones, they left for posterity. They wanted you to know what they did on their headstone, it says infantry, it says cannon master, it says cavalry, it says sharpshooter. They have it on their headstone because they wanted to send a message down through the generations that this freedom that we enjoy today was paid for with lives and blood and we must never forget that and we must honor those brothers that laid down their lives so that we could be a free people. So, the South is defeated. Du Bois writes a book called Black Reconstruction. How many of you have read that book? Black Reconstruction by W. E. B. Du Bois. He says for a moment, we stood in the sunlight of democracy. Uh -huh. What happened 
with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Black men got the right to vote, and what did they do? They elected what was called, became known as the Reconstruction Governments. These were state legislatures, many of which were predominantly black. They were the state legislatures of the previous Confederate states. And do you know what these Reconstruction Governments did? Do you know what was one of the first things that they did? They created free public schools. The origin of free public education is down deep in the abolition of slavery and the freedom that our people attained after the Civil War. We gave this country free public education. And this is what, why we must fight, brothers and sisters. They want to destroy public education. They want to privatize these public schools. They want to set up a, another whole system in which the majority of our children will not be able to participate. We must fight for free public education. Keep our public schools public. Don't privatize our schools. Because I know it's, it's, hard, for, it's hard for you to get this right. And I know a lot of you feel, well, these schools are not as good. Let them take, let you have to pay for public schools. Then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Then you'll be mobilized and trying to get it back, but it's too late. You better hold on to it while you got it now. You better fight for it right now. Because if they take it away, it's going to be hard to get back. So brothers and sisters, By 1877, Reconstruction comes to an end. And it was one of those Bush Gore moments, you know? <laughs> Where one person had the electoral votes, and one person had the popular votes. And they made a deal, they said, all right, you can have the White House if you take the federal troops out the South. Because see, see, you got to grasp this. It took force of arms to end slavery. I mean, we talk about the ancestors, the ancestors, the ancestors. Let's talk about what the ancestors had to do. The ancestors was fighting to get loose. <laughs> the ancestors wasn't standing around. The ancestors from the beginning, we were fighting from the beginning. We fought against the slavers in Africa. We fought on the slave ships. And we fought here in the United States. And while we remember people like Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman, we also should remember people like Nat Turner and Denmark Vesey, who stood up and used force of arms. Don't teach me about the American Revolution. And it was right for the American colonists to pick up arms against their British oppressors. If it was good for the American colonists, it's good for us, brothers and sisters. We need to celebrate those brothers and sisters that led slave rebellion. And so Reconstruction comes to an end, and we are literally re-enslaved. They call it Jim Crow, but it's really re-enslaved. It's just, it's just slavery by another name. Slavery by another name. And so Carter Woodson, people say, well, you know, they cheated us. They gave us February. Well, first of all, they didn't give us a damn thing. We chose February. Carter Woodson chose the week in February. And what week did he chose? He chose the week of Frederick Douglass' birthday and Lincoln's birthday. What's Frederick Douglass' birthday? February 14th, Valentine's Day. That is the birthday to Frederick Douglass. That is the date that he chose as his birthday because he himself really didn't know his real birthday. This was the condition of many of our people. They chose their birthdays. And so Negro History Week started, and it came out of a practice that people had. At the turn of the century, Carter G. Woodson comes home, and what does he do? He writes columns for the black newspapers about our history. Now, a lot of our people couldn't read, so what did they do? They took Carter Woodson's columns to church, and when church service was over, people would stay back and the one who could read would stand up in the congregation 
and read Carter Woodson's column to the people. And out of this practice, this weekly practice, came this week of celebration, Negro History Week, came Negro History Month. And you know what we went through. We went through, we were Africans when we got here, then we was colored, then we was Negro, then finally we discovered we black. Today we're African Americans. So Black History Month follows that. It was Negro History Month. By the 1970s, it's Black History Month, and many of us say African History Month and African American History Month today. But it is important for us to know that history, brothers and sisters. Our history is a history of struggle. You know, if black history is just a list of important dates, if black history is just a list of black people that invented things, and I'm not, I'm not using saying that pejoratively, God bless our brothers and sisters who have the genius to invent things. But if you only focus on important personalities, important dates, and important things we invented, you miss the whole purpose of black history. The whole purpose of history is to give you the trajectory, the historical trajectory of our people and the lessons that we have drawn from our historical experience. And Frederick Douglass sums up our historical experience the best when he says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. No one gave us anything. Anything that we have of value today, we had to fight for. And we should be proud of those who stood up and who fought so that we could enjoy what few benefits we have today. This year, 2014, marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act. The two great achievements of the struggle against Jim Crow, well, there were many achievements, but two of the many achievements of the Civil Rights Movement were the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, two things about this. This year is the 50th anniversary of the, of the Civil Rights Act. But also, this year is the year that the Voting Rights Act will come up for renewal. And all of us need to be in on that. Because I heard somebody that was up here earlier talking about voting rights, unless I was wrong. Do you see what's going on today? in America, they are passing all of these laws, once again, trying to suppress our ability to vote. Because what happened when we got the right to vote? We elected Reconstruction governments. We established the Freedmen's Bureau. We established free public education, other public institutions. That had to go. Then we got the Voting Rights Act passed. In 1966, there were 465 black elected officials in America. By 1972, there were over 10,000. And then these people, the descendants of their former slaves, get together and send a person of African descent to the White House in 2008. We should be proud of that, brothers and sisters. And not only that, getting reelected in 2012. Regardless of what you think, regardless of what you think about Obama's policies, the fact that we get, you ask somebody, you ask some people around here to be truthful. You ask them if in 2007 they thought a black man was going to be elected president. You ask them if they thought a black man with an African name was going to be elected president. <laughs> I didn't even think it was going to happen. But we caught on fight. And we lined up at the voting booth like people lined up in South Africa to elect Nelson Mandela. And in 2014, see, we can't just vote in the presidential election. We got to vote in every election. The reason we got to vote in every election and the reason why you got Chris Christie in Trenton now. We came out in 2008 
but we went back to sleep in 2009. You think it's not important? Christy killed the art project. The art project would have provided 30,000 jobs in this area, and many of them were labor jobs that people didn't have to have degrees to do. They needed folks to dig that tunnel. And Christy, one of the first things he did was kill the tunnel project. And that had a direct impact. I know some of y'all walk right here talking about politics don't affect me, politics ain't important. That's a whole lot of BS. Politics controls your life, brothers and sisters. The only reason you think it don't do anything to you or for you is because you don't know what it does for you. It's not because it doesn't, it's because you don't know. You don't know. If you understood how every political institution, every level of government has a major impact on your life and the lives of your children, and there's no reason why any black person that's a descendant of those who were enslaved in this country should not be at a voting booth every time election is called. You're the one that don't know. You think that you don't know. And it's our responsibility to educate ourselves so we do know. Ignorance is one of the biggest weapons the oppressor has. Apathy is another one. Ignorance and apathy equals stay in your place. And I don't know about you, I don't want to stay in the place I'm at. I think I want to go up a few steps. See, history is not a TV program with episodes, with a beginning and a happy ending. History is a continuum. Our story has not yet ended. It never ended. It only ends in books. And this struggle goes on between the forces of progress and the forces of reaction. It's not like a baseball game or a basketball game. One side lose, everybody go home. No, the oppressor, when he loses, he has a meeting the next day. How can we turn the situation around? You know what I'm talking about. When Obama got elected, the next day the Republicans were having a meeting. How can we make his presidency a failed presidency? And some of us fell into the trap. We became complacent. We were so filled with joy about having did what we did in 08 that we didn't think about what we needed to do in 09. And what happened? They got control of Congress. And so effectively, even if Obama wanted to do, wanted to do some of those things that we would like him to do, he can't do it because he needs both houses of Congress to pass his legislation. So we got to vote in 14 and in 15 and again in 16. And you know, it's like sometimes, brothers and sisters, we got to make hard decisions. See, what's the difference between leadership and being popular? I don't know much about the Bible. I'm not a very religious person. I don't belong to a church, but I can read. And from time to time, I pick up that book and I read it. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I need a help. I saw there was a minister in here earlier. Maybe the minister could help me. But see, in the Old Testament, there were kings and there were prophets. The kings did what was expedient for the nation. The prophets did what was right. Because you see, what's expedient may not always be right. And see, the king was popular. David was popular. You know David, the king of Israel. They sang songs about David. 
David went out and conquered the Philistines. David came back on the horse. They were going in front of David and said, Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. David was popular, but Samuel the prophet was not popular. John the Baptist was not popular. There were two kings. Israel was invaded. Two kings got together. And you know, whenever before they went into battle, they would consult the prophets. One of the kings said to the other king, let's go get Elisha to tell us what to do. The other king said, I'm not going to get Elijah. Elijah never has anything good to say. Sometimes we got to tell the truth even when the truth won't make us popular. Sometimes we got to tell the truth even when it might not be the thing the people who are closest to us want to hear. And that's the difference between being a child and being a man. Because when you're a child, you want to be loved by everybody. But when you're an adult, sometimes you're required to do what's right even when people don't like it. This is a hard thing. And this is where we are now. We have to tell some hard truths to each other at this stage of our struggle. Like one truth is that after the black power movement, and the black cultural arts movement, and the black political movement, and the election of black people to office, and the attainment of black people to levels of corporate CEOs, and the appointment of black judges, and the appointment of black prosecutors, and the election of black governors, and black senators, and a black person in the White House, that the majority of our people are still catching hell in the 21st century. See, some people just want to focus on the good, but not the bad. Our people are suffering, and we're in worse shape today than we were in 68 when Dr. King was assassinated. Here's another hard truth. 40 years after the Black Power Movement, some of us are still ashamed of being black. There's still black people running around here getting bleach and cream. Yes, sir. Still black people ready to fight if you call them black. Uh -huh. Still us trying to make our hair bone straight. We don't even just straighten it. We want bone straight now. Some of us still, you know, when I was a kid, we used to get our mother's stocking caps and put the new Nile in our head. Remember new Nile? <laughs> and take our mother's stocking and cut it off and make a hat and pull that thing down. It was so tight, it used to lead a mark right across our forehead. Because we didn't want nappy hair. We didn't like ourselves. That's what Malcolm said, right? We hated ourselves. We hated the color of our skin. We hated the flatness of our nose, the thickness of our lips. Some of y'all still run around and tell your children, pull your lips in because you don't want their regular lips to be shown. When I was a kid, they used to take us, they used to take clothes pin and put on our noses because they didn't want our noses to be African noses. They wanted to be aquiline noses. And still, 40 years later, you can ride the bus. Kids getting ready to fight, the first thing one will say to the other, you black so-and-so. Because we're still struggling with this issue of self-hatred. And we're still letting, you know, the other night I was in a meeting and people were lamenting the fact that we are so divided. Well, you know, it's true and it's not true. In one sense, we are pretty united. I mean, considering where we were, and what we've done to get where we are today, it took a high level of unity to make that happen. But the fact of the matter is that there are divisions that we have to overcome. There are religious divisions among us. Muslims don't want to meet with Christians and Christians don't want to meet with Muslims. 
There are ideological differences among us. And the religious differences don't just, not just Muslim and Christian. The Pentecostal don't want to get with the Baptists. And the Baptists don't want to get with the Methodists. As you know, in the AMEs, it's going in a whole nother direction. We have to overcome whatever divides us because our history shows us that when we are united brothers and sisters, nobody can stop us. When we are united, nobody can stop us. Nothing can stop us when we are united. Here's another truth. The enemy has peeped our whole car. Do you know that they openly speak of not renewing the Civil Rights Act? They openly speak of not renewing the Voting Rights Act? You know why? Because they sense and see our weakness. I know this is a painful thing to say, but after 40 years of black history programs, this auditorium should be filled. It should be filled. They sense our weakness. You know like animals can sense when another animal is wounded and you see how the hyenas circle around an animal. The animal ain't he dead. He's not dead. But they sense his weakness. The hyenas circle around and the vultures are circling around because they know dinner is coming. We have to recover the strength that we had in the 60s. We have to recover that strength. And all these organizations that we are part of, we got to build these organizations up. I mean, the fact of the matter is that when they say that they are going to cut unemployment benefits, when so many of our people are unemployed, regardless of who calls the demonstration, thousands of us need to be there. When they say they're going to cut food stamps, when half of our people live in poverty and are dependent on food stamps, there should be thousands of people at the food stamp office demonstrating. When they say that they're going to cut Social Security, when so many of our senior citizens, that is absolutely the only income that they have, and a cut in Social Security could be the difference between them eating tuna fish and eating cat food, we should be demonstrating in the tens of thousands. They sense our weakness. When so many of our people are sick and they say they're going to close our hospital we should be shutting the city down. No, you're not closing any hospitals in our community. But look how many hospitals that they've closed. And these are not just institutions for the sick. Many of these hospitals are the biggest employers in our community. In Orange, New Jersey, they closed Orange Memorial. It was the biggest employer in the town. In Plainfield, New Jersey, they closed Muhlenberg Hospital. It was the biggest employer in the town. They closed two hospitals, Columbus and St. James and North. Now they're talking about closing, they might even close University Hospital. Go 
When these things happen, we should be on the front lines. One of the reasons that we are in this shape today is because we have become complacent. We have become apathetic. We have become callous toward our brother and sister. We made the most progress in the 60s because we were literally making revolution in this country. You don't believe me? Do you know? People talk about the Newark Rebellion. Newark wasn't the only rebellion. Between 1960 and 1972, there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in America. This is why they was coming. Yeah, let's get the Civil Rights Act passed. The civil rights people were turning it upside down in the South, and we were turning it upside down in the North. We were in the streets. Do you see what people all over the world are doing today against governments that they are unhappy with? They are in the streets. And if we want change, we got to get back out in the streets in big numbers like we did in the 1960s. This is the challenge that we have been faced with for 40 years. This is the challenge. And my regret, what breaks my heart is that I feel like for 40 years I have not done what I should have done. My organization should have thousands of members by now. The NAACP should have millions of members by now. We should be mobilizing at a moment's notice. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if they thought that we could put on a regular basis, not just a million men in Washington, but millions of people on the streets of cities all across this nation, this bull crap would not be going on today. It would not be happening. It would not be happening. It's happening because they have grasped our weakness. So what does the time require of us? The time requires of us to systematically and scientifically build our organizations, make our organizations stronger, and then make our organizations work together with each other. Too many of us are motivated by the newspaper and TV coverage. Sometimes I wish there even wasn't no newspapers and television. We jockeying for position to get into the newspaper, jockeying to get on the television cameras, jealous about other people that get more coverage than we. That means nothing. Our people are suffering. Our children are dying. Our senior citizens are homeless. Our children are uneducated. Our young men are unemployed. Our young men are locked up in 1966. There were only 100,000 black men in federal prisons. 100,000. It was proportionately equal to our proportion of the population, 10 to 13 percent. It has increased tenfold in federal prisons alone. It's over a million. And it's not just men, it's women. And the state prisons are worse than the federal prisons. The state prisons are 70% New Jersey state prisons, 70% black and Latino. And do you know what this is, brothers and sisters? Jim Crow is too mild a term. This is not the new Jim Crow. This is a new form of slavery. This is the re-enslavement the re-enslavement of our people. In the, and you think that I, it is a metaphor? You think this is hyperbole? 
No, they got these prisoners making stuff for major corporations. You know what the biggest investment is on the stock market now? Prison construction. You know who's in it? Companies like American Express. They're privatizing all the prisons and making them profit-making institutions. And who are the generate, what's generating that profit? Slave labor. It's slave labor. There's no other name. What are you going to call it? Prison labor? <laughs> and mask what it really is? It's slave labor. This is the re-enslavement of our people. Modern day slavery, that's right. We got to fight, brothers and sisters. Now is the time for us to fight. If I had something else to tell you, I would tell you. I wish I could sing you a song that you would really like. I wish I could sing you a song that would make you happy and make you leave here on a cloud. But unfortunately, I'm not the one. So tell Jeffrey Dye, don't invite Larry Ham back here next year because he don't have anything good to say. He does not make us feel good. I didn't come here to make you feel good. I came here to give you a warning. I came here to give you a warning that if we don't get ourselves together, we are going to be on somebody's nickel. Here lay the late great black people of America that once existed. I'm ready to fight. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to fight. Our people have paid too much in lives, in blood, in sacrifices for us to let them take away all that they fought for. And there's some people in power right now, they want to, some of them want to take us back to Jim Crow, some of us want to take us back to slavery, if they could, if they could get away with it and use the Bible to justify it. Y'all saw 12 years of slave, right? You remember when Epps, the slave master Epps, Epps was the mean slave master. The first scene's open, what is Epps doing? He's reading from the Bible. Servant, obey thy, he's reading from Paul, by the way, the apostle Paul. Servant, obey thy master. If you don't obey your master, you shall have many stripes. <laughs> And F adds his own editorial and says, 100, 150. I'm ready to fight. I'm looking for a thousand black people that are ready to fight. I'm looking for a thousand black people who, is, who, is, who have said enough is enough. I'm looking for a thousand black people who are ready to answer the call to action when the word is given. Because I promise you that the years ahead are going to be filled with catastrophe. They are going to be filled with catastrophe. And we need a unit of people who are ready to stand and fight back. A million of us went to Washington, the Million Man March. It was a great achievement. But now we need a million people who are ready to fight. Not just go to Washington for a prayer meeting. And I was one of the organizers of the Million Man March. I was the Jersey coordinator. So I'm not saying this pejoratively here. I'm just telling it like I see it. We need to produce a million people in the cities where we live, not just in Washington, D.C. There's seven million people in New York City. Imagine if there was an organization that could mobilize a million of them at a moment's notice. All this foolishness would stop. It'd be like, come to, look, come to the table, please. <laughs> Let's talk this out. They're closing our schools. They're going to lay off a thousand teachers in Newark over three years. I didn't know they still had a thousand teachers, so that means there's going to be ten teachers left in Newark. They're going to lay off a thousand teachers in three years. They're closing our schools, they're closing our hospitals, they're closing the, the, the post offices, they closed the factories, the factories are all going abroad, they're foreclosing on our homes. How much more do they have to close before we say we draw the line right here? 
So I know, brothers and sisters, I, this is not the kind of celebratory advice that you might have wanted to have, but I see no other thing. I'm 60 years old. I got on this path at the age of 17 in 1971. And I've been on this path for 43 years. And in 43 years, I've seen the condition of my people deteriorate. And I tell you, that this book says we only get three score and ten. So my, I might have ten good ones left. And I tell you, I don't know about you, but I know that before my time is up, I want to leave here having struck a blow for freedom. I don't want to go out quietly. I don't want to go out being remembered as a nice guy. I don't want to go out having been loved by all, by my enemies, as well as my friend. No, I don't want to go out like that. I want to go out, and when I'm gone, I want my enemies to say, damn, I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> See, you want to go out, you want to be everybody's friend. I'm past being everybody's friend. I'm not running for office, and I won't run for office. I want to be with that band. I want to be with Nat Turner's people. I want to be with Denmark Vesey's people. I want to be with Sinke's people. I want to be with Tucson's people and Dessaline's people. That's the people I want to be with. I want to have struck a blow against those who have oppressed and continue to oppress my people. And that's what I want to do. And I hope, brothers and sisters, you will want to do the same thing. So I invite you, please join somebody's organization. Calvin Merritt is here from the NAACP. Join the NAACP. I heard there's a group called the Muscle Group. Join that. A group called the Brothers. Join that. Community Unity Leadership Council, join that, or join the People's Organization for Progress, but join something. That's right. Black Men's Group, I saw Brother Eddie Little here. Join something, but don't stop with your joining. We got to go out and get other people to join and make our organization strong for the fight ahead. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. <laughs>